A very warm welcome to all our viewers here today at the Capital Insider Series or by Entrepreneur India. Uh, today we are speaking uh, on the rising role of data in venture fund investments. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to be joined by um, Mr. Shailesh Ramakrishna from Rocketship VC, an early stage venture capital firm, who are using data science to democratize venture capital and have more recently announced an uh, it has raised 100 million uh, US dollar for its fund number round two. Uh, they're based in Los Altos, California and Rocketship had its first fund of $40 million. And this is the second fund that they have done. And in that $40 million first fund, the firm had invested in 44 portfolio companies across seed A, seed B rounds with 46% investments made outside the US. So thank you Shailesh very much for joining us here today as we talk about uh, the kind of work that you'll be doing. I understand that there is some very interesting work that is happening at Rocketship VC where you're using data mining in order to sort of pinpoint to the companies and to the sectors which are tomorrow's most promising sectors and the future of, uh, uh, you know, so to say tech uh, in the coming times. Um, so, you know, would love to hear from you. Of course, you have got such a fantastic, uh, you know, work uh, model yourself. I mean, look at him. I mean, he's uh, an IIT Madras. So uh, back here from India when he did it. And then of course he went on to do his master's and uh, doctorate also in um, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and then he's worked in various firms. He's been an entrepreneur for a while before he sort of let go of his uh, startup and uh, has been working at Walmart Labs. And now, of course, he's the partner at uh, Rocketship VC where he is actually in investing in other startups. So thank you for joining us today. Um, would love to know about, you know, this wonderful model that you have at Rocketship VC, which is really to sort of understand and use data in order to find out which could be the most promising startups and also understand that you actually pick up your startups more over Zoom meetings than you actually meet founders in person. So please tell us more about it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for having me uh, this morning. Uh, and thank you for your kind words uh, of introduction as well. Um, so so we, the, the reason we came up with this idea for Rocketship was a combination of uh, two significant aspects. One is our, our own careers. Uh, my fellow partners, Anand, Venki, and myself, we are all data scientists. Uh, we've been practicing AI and machine learning for the last uh, 20 years in our careers. Uh, we are also entrepreneurs, as you mentioned. We have uh, either founded or, uh, or built startups for most of our careers. Um, and, uh, you know, the, we have a very strong uh, interest in investing. My other two partners have been tremendously successful investors as well. So the, the, that aspect of our personality all combined was something we wanted to work on next. You know, the, the next venture had to include a little bit of that machine learning and data science, a little bit of uh, entrepreneurship and founders, uh, as well as investing. And the other aspect, uh, which is also something you alluded to, is um, you know we we had we had in most of our careers as our founders had uh, had the opportunity to raise financing from a wide variety of uh, of um, um, uh, amazing investors. Uh, but a lot of that had to do with uh, with who we had met, who we had networked with, who we had connections with. And we would go pitch them and hence those financing rounds would happen. But we were always wondering how this model can be disrupted. And we felt that one of the great democratizers, one of the great levelers uh, was the ability to find companies through data. So it was those two themes coming together that led us to, to sort of creating uh, what eventually became Rocketship. And of course, as with, uh, with any interesting venture, this was not something we knew was going to work from the get go, uh, and in, in some sense, we are just as much uh, we were just as much a startup at that time as any other startup. Which is, we asked ourselves, is this going to work? Are we going to be able to find good company? Are we going to a, be able to connect with them without meeting them in person? Will we be able to convince both them and ourselves uh, to 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 write that check and make that investment? And and much to our own uh, pleasant surprise, as well as uh, um, the, the, the sort of the satisfaction of seeing something initially work. Uh, our, our algorithms worked amazingly well. And uh, what we had going for us significantly was uh, that entrepreneurship had become significantly global. Uh, it was no longer restricted 
to developed markets. Uh, there was, you know, it could be as easy for somebody in some small town in India to be building an, a world-class company as it could be for somebody here in, in San Francisco. So that enabled us to find some amazing companies all over the world. And, uh, and we were off to the races in, in becoming a, a global investor. Um, and once you realize that, that entrepreneurship has gone global and that the old model of who you know and those networks are disrupted, the only way to reach out to this amazing, amazing number of startups is through data because there are thousands and thousands of these startups. Uh, and hence, data plays a, a significant role in our process. Sure, no, that's wonderful. And you know, what is more uh, important is that you're just not looking in the Silicon Valley where you based yourselves, but you're really looking outside and developing and uh, even less developed countries uh, to find out startups. So just for the uh, sake of our audience, if you can tell us what are the parameters on which you sort of uh, mine these companies and you know, what, what areas do you look for in such companies when you are data mining and trying to figure out that these companies would work? Uh, it's a great question. And, and uh, while I will tell you uh, my answer to the best of my ability, you're also asking me for our secret sauce. So uh, I will have to keep <laughs> some of that uh, a little bit held back, but I'm more than happy to share uh, our experiences uh, in, in, in this learning process. And, and it has been a learning process for us uh, as well. Um, so we started off by trying to see what information is available about startups these days. And once again, um, we were lucky in our timing because if you were asking this question maybe 20 years ago, there was not going to be much information available. Startups at that time were thought of as being stealthy and in the sense that they were quietly building this idea and were going to launch it in some uh, you know, sort of big bang. And then that's when you find out. Um, whereas in these last five to 10 years, um, uh, startups being online has become tremendously important to them for their own execution, mainly because they have to reach out to their customers and they also have to attract great talent. So if you start looking at it from that perspective, many, many startups are, are, are actively um, um, sort of uh, have significant online presences, if you will. And, and given that, uh, uh, that aspect of a lot of them being online, they leave a lot of information behind. Uh, whether you think about it as just the sheer uh, uh, existence of the startup, where it's located, what business it's in, to things like social media, marketing, uh, advertising, uh, to, to team information in places like LinkedIn or GitHub. There's a lot of information um, uh, about the startup itself. Uh, and then, of course, there's uh, job boards where the startups are advertising for hiring, for jobs, uh, as well as doing you know, media events uh, and have publications uh, in, 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 in forums such as yours. So if you consider all of that data together, while it doesn't tell us whether a startup is going to become a, a very successful company or a unicorn, there is enough information uh, where a machine learning algorithm can glean the, the, the sort of the secret ingredients to when a startup is likely to be successful. And one other nugget I'll share with you is uh, it's, uh, it's almost uh, impractical to ask the question of a startup that is maybe one to two years old, are you going to become a billion dollar outcome? Uh, while some of the more prescient uh, investors are able to make that judgment, a machine learning algorithm is not able to, for the simple reason you're asking it to predict something that is you know, five, seven, 10 years in the future from perhaps only one year's worth of data. Uh, and, and, and so it's an impractical uh, way of asking that question. So one of the innovations we uh, did was to ask the right kinds of questions from the machine learning algorithm in order to figure out what kinds of startups are potentially likely to be successful. And I do also use the word algorithm, but it's actually not just one algorithm. Uh, as, uh, as most people in machine learning will tell you, we have several models uh, running concurrently, trying to assess different aspects of a startup. Um, Having said all that, I will also answer your question directly as saying many of these algorithms are built by us uh, and hence we as humans um, provide the same sort of analysis a typical investor would do. 
So we look at uh, what the company is doing, which business is it in, which country is it based, what is its market, who are the people, what are the teams involved. All of those things are also incorporated because we are the ones uh, building these algorithms. We think those factors are important. Surely. And uh, understandably, Rocketship VC is focusing on deep tech uh, startups. So, you know, what I mean, and I've seen the portfolio and I see there's a lot of fintech in the portfolio. There is also a lot of emphasis you're putting on edtech now, understandably, given the pandemic. So post the pandemic, what what sectors are you uh, sort of uh, betting high on? You know, you think they're more promising and therefore uh, likely to go there. Sure. Um, uh, just one clarification, and I think you observed this correctly. Uh, we do invest in uh, pretty much uh, all uh, applicable sectors in terms of startup investing, uh, not just deep tech alone. Uh, it's just that our portfolio somewhat naturally represents areas uh, of startups or sectors where there's more data. Uh, and, and, and FinTech, as you mentioned, is, a, is one of those clear examples. There's usually a lot of data about FinTechs available uh, most fintechs are out in the market. There's a lot of marketing going on. People talk about uh, various fintech services. Um, there's uh, uh, social media. There's a lot of rapid growth potential. So there's a lot of information available about fintech that naturally leads uh, them to be better uh, uh, evaluated by our algorithms. Uh, another similar example is also e-commerce. So e-commerce also lends itself more naturally to this approach. So if you look at the two most significant sectors in our portfolio, it's e-commerce and fintech. But we also have a wide representation of startups all the way from things like food delivery to a hardware company that's producing a wireless chip. Um, now to answer your next question, which is what are we so excited by uh, in, in the coming future? Um, uh, one of the most uh, interesting things for me personally is to watch our data show us these trends as they are about to happen or are happening. And so we have almost like a ringside view of what's uh, about to happen. And uh, FinTech plays a significant role uh, in, in these trends. Uh, and India in particular also plays a significant role in these trends. Uh, India is, I think, rapidly uh, uh, growing up in terms of its maturity, in terms of both as a market, as well as the quality and level of services that are expected both by consumers, but also interestingly by businesses. Businesses are no longer satisfied to be working on archaic software platforms. They are also uh, looking for cutting edge solutions, uh, things that work on tablets or phones. Uh, and, and the whole consumer business interface is significantly uh, being upgraded in, in India. Uh, in FinTech in particular, um, uh, you know, one of the most important aspects of, of a growing economy is access to capital. And hence, we are seeing that aspect becoming a significant part. Uh, ask, access to capital uh, in the consumer side looks like it's lending, uh, lending from a wide variety of, of uh, methodologies. Uh, some is general purpose lending, short-term loans, long-term loans, term loans, but also something more uh, uh, narrowly focused that is specific to a use case, like uh, loans for educational purposes, uh, travel abroad to, to get a new degree, uh, or medical expenses, or a short-term uh, you know, sort of cash flow bridge until you get your next paycheck. So there are many uh, ways in which uh, this, uh, this particular access to capital is transforming. Uh, the sort of the uneven capital needs that, that people have uh, in, 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 a, in a fast growing economy. Uh, the same aspect is also uh, happening on, on the business side. Um, uh, business capital was typically underserved. Uh, it was a lot of, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a lot more sort of, um, I would say inefficiency in businesses getting access to capital and that is significantly changing. Of course, that also has come about because there's also better information available. Where before part of the inefficiency was a, a lender like a, a bank would have to analyze a lot of information in order to understand the credit worthiness of a business. These days, a lot of that is computerized. You're able to look at the information that the business is able to provide and get a much better sense of their credit worthiness and hence uh, access to capital is much more available. But even there, we are seeing a significant innovation uh, we are seeing innovation where you're looking at specific aspects of a business. There's working capital loans. Uh, there's uh, specific loans uh, for, for uh, backed by things like account receivable, account uh, uh, payables. 
supply chain financings, um, uh, transportation financings, things that are so much more specific, uh, but are incredibly important in allowing a business to really uh, scale up rapidly, given that uh, India is growing significantly. So, so FinTech is something we are very excited by. Uh, lending and access to capital is the first layer we are seeing a lot of activity on. But the next level down is banking itself is undergoing a rapid change as well. And, and this has been further accelerated by, by the pandemic. If you cannot go to a bank branch, if you cannot go to an ATM, how are we supposed to make these financial transactions happen? Well, the answer is these, uh, these banks that are called neo banks or mobile only banks or, or mobile first banks. So it leads to a very different consumer interface, uh, very different capabilities that you can incorporate into and provide the, in the hands of, of consumers. And that is, I think, changing uh, businesses uh, as well as consumers' uh, behavior significantly. Uh, the third, and uh, you know, this is an area that is now seeing a second level of resurgence. Um, um, it, there were many solutions for this initially, but now there are even more uh, fun, you know, sort of amazing solutions. And India is, I think, in the forefront of this is payments. Uh, payments across uh, all the spectrum from small payments that you're using through you know, something like Paytm, through, uh, through now UPI-based payments, through payments directly from your bank accounts, to payments directly from off of your paycheck. Money transfers are much, much more uh, sort of easy and fast. Uh, so the, the, the whole uh, payments infrastructure in India is being upgraded uh, to a point where I would say in, in, in some instances, it's actually much better than the developed world. So, and, and this is a, a sort of a, a meta trend, if you will, is that when infrastructure is lacking initially, it offers uh, the country to leapfrog, not be tied up with old archaic systems, but leapfrog to the next generation. And I think India is accomplishing that uh, significantly. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, uh, can you give us some insights into the investments that you've made in India and Southeast Asia? I understand, you know, there are, uh, there are startups like Kata Book and Find where you put some uh, significant amount of, uh, and I mean, later round capital. So what what is it that you sort of, what prompted you to them? And now what kind of returns in these startups are you beginning to uh, growth you're beginning to see versus a similar startup in let's say in any other country in a developed market a Silicon Valley or maybe even a Hong Kong or some other places. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and as I said, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this uh, previously, um, outside of the US, India is the next largest country in which we have investments. And, sure. um, and, and, and this is not because we are of Indian origin, as you observed, this is more because, uh, as I said, uh, India is, uh, is a very exciting capital destination at this point because amazing companies are being built, amazing opportunities are available. And, uh, and these opportunities are, 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 are large, not just because of uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the lack of, uh, of the, the infrastructure, but also because India represents a very, very large market. Uh, and, and so I think that's super exciting. Um, in terms of uh, examples, uh, our, uh, our uh, investments in India span uh, B2C, things like, uh, you know, find, uh, as you mentioned, to B2B companies like uh, Moglix. Uh, we are an investor in, in Moglix. We are also investors in No Broker in, in the B2C space, but it's in real estate, as well as uh, it a, has a significant sort of software uh, component, if you will. Um, we are also recently investors in, in Kata Book, as you, as you observed. Um, there, that's a, that, that's a, uh, that straddles the line between B2B and, and B2C in that it's for you know, small Kirana stores, but there are hundreds of thousands, millions of them uh, in India. Uh, and so that's been very exciting. Uh, we are also recent investors in Yulu. Um, Yulu is the, uh, is the battery powered Bye. mobility uh, yes. service. Um, and and uh, again, the metrics there were very interesting for us to see. Uh, and, and we have become strong believers in the fact that I think electric mobility uh, is going to be the most cost effective and efficient way of, of transportation, especially in a, in a congested, travel congested country like India. Um, in, in, in the more recent uh, investments that we have made have uh, been companies that are uh, getting significant COVID uh, tailwinds. Uh, of course, uh, there are companies in, in education as well as in 
uh, in sort of skills management. So we have investments, uh, most, mo most recent investment is in a company called Apna. Mm -hmm. uh, Apna has created a platform for um, uh, sort of blue collar workers, but workers who are, um, who are a, a large enough number, but the hiring of them has never had a formal process. Uh, white collar workers perhaps have LinkedIn and the wide variety of job boards, you know, monster.com and so on. But for, uh, if you wanted to hire a local plumber or an electrician or a carpenter, uh, there was never a process. There was never an easy way. And, and, and I'm not talking about just, uh, you know, for a home use of one uh, hiring a carpenter, there are, uh, you know, there are uh, building companies that need to hire a carpenter uh, for a career. And even that was hard to. Um, and so uh, this company has uh, built an amazing platform that not only brings these people together, provides them a community, gives them a sense of identity in this new online world. And that's been amazing as well. So we, our, our investments span this uh, gamut. Um, we, have, we have investments, like I said, in education, in, in skills resharing, in FinTech, uh, as well as in commerce. So, so most of the investments I also see are uh, towards, you know, digital transformation of a sector, you know, whether it is digitization of Kiranas or electric mobility, which is, of course, going to change the, uh, you know, your the internal combustion engine vehicles. So, uh, I mean, given all this, uh, from an Indian perspective, what is the larger, uh, you know, digital offshoot that you see coming to happen? And do you feel that because of that and significant size that India has today uh, to do that? And I mean, it's, it's just started, you know, uh, there, there are millions of family businesses out here in India, which would need digital transformations happening for them. So where do you see India as an opportunity market? Uh, and I mean, not just for your fund, but at large, uh, in the coming years, large, may, may, maybe the next five years? Uh, you know, we are very excited for India. Like I said, um, uh, while we are uh, personally of Indian origin and we are always excited to be investing in India from, from that perspective, what makes it even more exciting is that our algorithms and our data find amazing opportunities uh, in India as well. And, and one way to sort of think about this is our algorithms are not just finding companies in isolation, What's actually happening in effect is a global competition where uh, our algorithms are ranking companies all over the world in all of these ecosystems. And the fact that Indian companies are wrong, uh, rankings at, at such high numbers, at high ranks, that leads us to be drawn to making investments in there tells you the, the, the opportunity that is available in India surpasses any other opportunity uh, elsewhere in the world, right? And that's what's exciting uh, about India as well. Um, to answer your question about how we see India in, in the next five years, I think the potential is enormous and uh, the digital transformation, I think, has a ways to go. Uh, and I think the fundamental building blocks are being built across a wide number of sectors. Um, th this transformation sort of started in the last five to 10 years, well, had a significant acceleration happen thanks to the geo rollout. Uh, I mean, adding a, a few hundred million mobile subscribers in a span of a few months rapidly changed the ecosystem. But that transformation has been ongoing uh, and, and more and more of this, this demand uh, for this, this ease of use, uh, removal of red, red tape, making sure efficiencies are built in is permeating every sector. Uh, recently, I think uh, several investors have uh, made a note of this, but we saw this uh, you know, quite early on, uh, even, even sort of old state sectors like agri-tech uh, we're seeing a resurgence because uh, uh, you know farmers are always thought of as folks who are not that technologically savvy, but that has actually changed significantly. Uh, today, most farmers want to know the exact uh, moisture levels in their soil, how much fertilizer to add, uh, because all of this makes uh, a significant impact to them on their bottom line, whether they make a profit or they take a loss, depends on their biggest cost inputs, which are water and, and fertilizer, uh, apart from seed stock. So I, uh, what I'm seeing uh, is every sector, I, I, don't, I believe there is no sector that will be untouched uh, through this transformation. And the core, at the core of this transformation is ubiquitous connectivity, uh, ubiquitous computing, which is uh, through the mobile phone, but also beyond the mobile phone through other computing devices and ubiquitous uh, financial transaction capabilities, which again, uh, through UPI and a wide variety of other services uh, we are making available. 
within the country. So these three aspects, I think, are at the core of this transformation. And we are seeing multiple versions of this happen. So if you think of commerce, now commerce has already evolved to uh, uh, the next generation where you know, you used to be in a couple of days, and then it became same day, and now you get deliveries in a few hours, right? Uh, if you take a step back and think about what that entails, it entails an enormous uh, sort of uh, improvement in efficiency in infrastructure from how fast an order gets transmitted to how quickly a payment is collected to how quickly the product is delivered. All of those things start need to start working in, in sort of synergy for this transformation to happen. And once that starts happening in one sector, we see the trickle down happen very, very rapidly because if one uh, sector has proven how this can potentially work, then all the other sectors start looking at it and saying, why is this not happening for me? Um, there was even a recent article about uh, things like, well, you know, if, if you can deliver, you know, a, a thing that I ordered, a toy that I ordered in a few hours, that same thing can be used to deliver fresh food in two hours, right? Uh, a meal in two hours and so on. So uh, uh, that, that just starts uh, sort of enabling capabilities uh, that change the common person's uh, perception of what is an expected level of service. Um, and I'm again, uh, very happy to say India is quite in the lead in some of these things. Uh, uh, it is still a challenge here in the US uh, to get those kinds of things to work here due to high cost, due to infrastructure, not uh, being a little bit more legacy. So, so I can perhaps get things here in a few hours, but the costs are much, much higher than in India. So our expectations here are different. Uh, I think uh, th this is the clearest case of uh, India being able to leapfrog because the existing legacy did not exist for them to have to overcome. Sure. Yeah, that's an interesting point. But coming back to your algorithm, you know, um, so I talk to a lot of uh, VCs and I talk to a lot of funds. And, you know, one thing they always sort of hint upon is that how important is the founder uh, to the whole uh, sort of mission of building a startup wherein, you know, his qualities and his um, um, you know, his uh, sort too, of, uh, passion um, matters. So how do you, how does the algorithm measure that? I mean, you know, how do you sort yeah. of deep dive into the founder's mind and figure out, you know, where is he going to, or she's going to lead the startup to? Exactly. So, so, uh, and, and the only reason I, I wanted to mention her versus his is that uh, this is the other aspect we are seeing. Our, our, our algorithms are seeing many companies founded by women as well uh, in sure. India. And, and, uh, I'm very excited to see that happening uh, within India. Um, to, to, to further elaborate how this works, um, th there is one level, uh, one class of models within our algorithms uh, that evaluate the quality of the team, uh, but that by no means is the only way in which we, uh, we evaluate the quality. And this is the reason why it's not just algorithmic. Our algorithmic uh, process identifies these companies but the role of human partners such as myself and my fellow partners is just as important in evaluating the company. And so the aspects that you are talking about, the hunger in the founder's eyes, the way they approach uh, the problems, the way they break through barriers and challenges that are faced, uh, they're facing, those are things that we assess in, in multiple conversations with the company. Um, so in one sense, we do a lot of the traditional VC work as well, where we talk to the company multiple times, we talk to our multiple team members, we talk to potential customers. Uh, we, we do a whole lot more of the traditional VC work, but we also have a lot of confidence in the work we are doing is because the algorithms found the company in the first place. So we do that from a sense of, there is a, there is a core within this company that we are really evaluating. Um, what, what this does for us is to really understand both the fact that there is an engine inside the company at work and that this team is capable of really revving that engine up to take this company to the next level. Uh, and, and oftentimes, and, and most investors will tell you this as well, oftentimes not all the information is available, not all the questions are answered, not all the risks are addressed. And what you really have left with is that conviction that this team will figure this out. And so that is something we also do. So, so to answer your question, perhaps much shorter than I should have elaborated is, this is not a 100% algorithmic approach. Human partners uh, uh, play an equal and important aspect. So it's a hybrid approach uh, where the things that the algorithms are capable of assessing, they do. The things that our humans are uh, better at, at assessing, we do. And combine, hopefully, the result is 
much better than either one of us. Sure. So we've got some questions coming. So there is Eric and on Facebook who's asked us that, can you give us some insights on SPACs? How will it benefit the startup ecosystem? Uh, uh, SPACs, I guess, are the uh, flavor of the season. Uh, and, and I'm happy to answer um, my opinion about them. Um, so, so this has always been a question uh, with respect to startups. It's, it's eventually when you need to go uh, to the sort of the public level, how do you reach that process? Uh, and, and as startups grow and mature, um, things get a, a whole lot more daunting as they get closer and closer to this milestone uh, for uh, you know, multiple reasons. One of the biggest reasons is, the, is not just the increased level of scrutiny, but the increased level of processes and paperwork that is needed in order to go public. You need to do a lot of preparation. You need to have a lot of systems built, compliance uh, mechanisms built, uh, because those are required both by regulation and by scrutiny uh, that will come from analysts and all the other folks uh, who will first, for the first time, get to see your books. So as, as time has gone on, that challenge has gotten only significantly harder, especially uh, due to the financial crisis here in the US, which caused uh, further regulations, the, the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, regulations, uh, as well as uh, other myriad regulations requiring the hoops that companies have to jump through becoming significant. Um, the SPACs sort of sidestep a lot of that, but not for too long, because what it only does is it, 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 it reduces the friction in getting to becoming public. But once you're public, all those regulations still land up on you. So you may not have the time, uh, you, you may not need to build them up in the first place, but once you have gone public, you are subject to these same regulations. So you have to do them anyway. Um, so in, in, in one sense, I believe uh, uh, SPACs are, uh, uh, you know, not so much a, a long-term solution as a, a short-term convenience, if you will. Uh, and in the, in the grand scheme of things, uh, what you're really banking on is the SPAC creator's uh, choice in terms of which companies they merge with versus not, uh, rather than any sort of systemic inefficiency that the SPACs remove. Sure. Uh, we've got another question in, from Panita who's saying that how has the early stage venture investing reshaped in the current times? I mean, this could be by, of course, fund size, by expectation of the investor, by, and I mean, you know, so just to sort of add to that question uh, is that do you, uh, does the fund foresee that, you know, uh, can we, instead of giving a founder one round of fund, give him two rounds of fund? Uh, so that, you know, he's more focused or she's more focused on the, the business itself rather than just thinking that, you know, okay, now I need to go out and raise the next round. So uh, do you think that approach is now changing from a fund's perspective? Uh, I, think, um, I think something a little bit more significant is happening. I, I believe that the dynamic of, of investors being sort of uh, these, these uh, people up on the mound offering largest or richest to uh, supplicants who are startups is completely outdated. That is no longer true anymore. Uh, startups are, 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 are able to build amazing companies with very little capital, thanks to technology. And that has evened the equation quite a bit. Uh, there are several companies for which investors have to compete with each other to, uh, be, uh, to have the privilege uh, if you will, of investing in, in these companies. So uh, I, I think um, the, the narrative has changed significantly. Uh, I think startups need to not just think about investors as sources of capital, but as partners who uh, must and should help uh, in, in making them successful. Now, of course, the majority of the onus is on the founders and the team of the startup, uh, but everybody within the startup's orbit needs to be aligned with supporting the startup. And that includes the investors and that goes beyond uh, the money involved. Um, and, and, and I think for those kinds of companies, for those kinds of startups with those kinds of investors, I think financing is most likely not going to be that much of an issue because you have not just a small team, you have a whole ecosystem supporting this company in its attempt to become successful. Sure. Uh, so uh, I think one of the final points before we need to close this is that, you know, you have 46 uh, companies in your portfolio and they are spread across the world. 
So do you in some way also promote interlearning amongst them? You know, you sort of, you obviously you seeing it from the nucleus point wherein, you know, this startup can help the other startup or so on. So do you sort of bring them closer together in order for them to grow and learn from each other? Absolutely, we do. And, and this is one of the most interesting uh, aspects of uh, my job personally, is having this kind of interaction with our startup founders. Uh, uh, as you might imagine, we, you know, we spend a lot of time talking to them, learning about what they're experiencing and patterns very rapidly start to establish themselves. And, and so uh, more often than not, we make significant interconnects between our founders not just from a, hey, you know, you guys are all part of, a, of the rocket ship portfolio, so you should know each other, but tactical introduction saying, hey, this person actually experienced this problem and had this solution, you might learn from this, or they are uh, approaching this problem in their country through this way, you might uh, want to look at that. So we have connected companies in Brazil to companies in India, we have connected companies in India to companies in US, uh, uh, all of those cross connections are happening uh, because I think, um, and again, I, 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 if I haven't said this, uh, I should say it again and again. The quality of the founders is just amazing. These are amazing people who have taken the risk and have the vision to build an enormously successful company. And what they need is, is sort of the, the, the right guidance at the right time to get tactically over some of these hurdles. But once you present the ingredients, they're able to really blow through and, 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 and build amazing companies. So, so we find that this ecosystem really helps them a lot. And we, we don't do this just within our own portfolio. We also do this with every uh, entrepreneur we meet uh, because every entrepreneur um, uh, is going through a similar story to us ourselves uh, when we were entrepreneurs. So we are more than happy to, to share in uh, our experience, make these connections with very little, if uh, no expectation of any benefit to us personally, other than to say, hey, I've known what you have gone through as a founder myself. And so I'm more than happy to find a way to help you. Sure. Thank you very much, Shailesh, uh, for actually joining us today uh, and talking to us about it. Of course, our participants, uh, as the gradually the day goes along, please keep your questions coming. Uh, I would request Shailesh, you know, as more questions add up on our Facebook Live talk, if you can sort of take some time to answer them and, uh, uh, you know, help the, uh, the other founders and other startups who join us here today um, to be able to gain from your knowledge. Thank you very much for joining us and we hope to meet you next time off the screen and in person, hopefully here in India, as we continue to grow the startup ecosystem and uh, you continue to invest in such startups. Thank you again. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you to your audience as well for uh, taking the time to, to listen to uh, what few words I had to say. Um, and, and my my parting thought to you is, uh, you know, don't hesitate, go start a company. Uh, it doesn't matter what age you are, what color of skin you are, which country you are in. I think starting a company is one of the most transformative experiences uh, that one can have in their uh, life. And so I urge everybody uh, to, to take that leap uh, when, the, when they deem that time is right. Sure. Thank you once again, Shailesh. Thank you. Bye. Bye.